Hi, Professor Mankowski here. In this video, we're going to start to talk about chapter six, which is the normal distribution. And normal distribution is synonymous with bell-shaped data sets. And students love bell-shaped data sets because especially when we take our exam, if the instructor tells us that the scores conform to a bell shape, usually that means that they might be able to curve because usually a bell curve is the first thing that they're going to look for to start putting bonus points on a test. Now there's lots of other really cool things about normal distributions like how they show up in natural sciences all over the place. If you think about uh, even daily life too, things like uh, the average uh, credit card payment that a college freshman might make, the average mortgage payment, the average weight of a uh, American adult, these things all conform to normal distributions. So that's why the probability techniques that we're going to learn are so really powerful. So when we think about bell shapes, all these different histograms come to mind. And which one looks like it's the bell shape? If you guess that one, you're exactly correct. So what we're going to be able to do is we're going to learn a lot more about how to do probability, how to do analysis with normal distribution curves. But before we get there, we're going to take a few minutes to talk about some of the really important probabilities, uh, some of the really important properties of the normal distribution curve so we understand it a little bit better. Now, when we're thinking of bell-shaped curve, why, uh, rather, when we're thinking of bell-shaped histogram, why do they refer to this as a bell-shaped curve? Reason is, if we were to superimpose a line over the silhouette, we get a bell shape. And this is really important for exactly two reasons. The first is it's just easier to represent your data with a line fit curve than if you use the histogram. Like if you think of how much work it took to get a frequency distribution done and then a histogram done, that's a lot of energy it takes. If you can make a line fitting curve instead to represent your data population, it's gonna be much easier for you. And one of the most important things that we need to remember when we do the curve is that the curve is on the outline of a histogram. And histogram represents 100% of our population. So what that means for us is the area under the curve represents 100% of our population. And believe it or not, just that one sentence, that red bold faced sentence is enough to drive almost all the probability that we're gonna be working in this chapter. Now the second reason is that if our data is curved linear, which just means the outline of the histogram follows a curved shape, then we can start to apply a lot of really neat calculus that helps us get through the probability that we're going to learn in a normal distribution. So before we start to do calculations, before we start to do formulas and stuff like that, we're going to talk about a few really critical properties of the normal distribution curve. Now, the first one is that when we think of where the mean, median, and the mode are, they're all right in the dead center of the curve. If we look at the left side of the curve and the right side of the curve, both of those sides are symmetrical, which is exactly why the left and right sides are mirror images of each other. Now, look at the tails of the curve. We're going to notice that the tails will become infinitely closer to the x-axis, but they won't actually touch the x-axis. And it's okay to get a little sloppy if we're doing homework or we're on the exam. It's okay to make the tails touch the x-axis. But in theory, the reason why they're not supposed to is because of outliers. So we always need to keep a little bit of gap of space, even if it's so small that we can't see it. We have to keep it there just to acknowledge that outliers might be out there. Now, again, the most important thing is that the area under the curve is always going to total 100%. So what we're going to do is we're going to find out that that one red sentence again area under the curve totals 100 percent that's enough for us to start doing some really cool probability stuff even if it's crude it's still enough to begin an analysis of probability with normal distributions here's how it works let's take an example of the population of uh, body weights of adults in america and we might say that the average american adult weighs 170 pounds so what we're going to do is we're going to shade all the area to the left of 170. And if we know that that area under the curve represents the whole entire population, what we've just shaded in is an area that represents about half of our population. So that means that the next person that walks through the door, the chance that they're going to weigh less than 170 pounds must be about 50% because we know half the population is less than 170 pounds. 
Let's do another example. So we're gonna keep the population of adult body weights at 170, right there in the center. But this time we're gonna to start to work with 168 pounds. And I'm gonna put 168 uh, arbitrarily on the left side of the mean, just because it's less than 170. And now I'm gonna shade in all the area that's less than 168 pounds. So it looks like I'm representing, if I was gonna approximate it, maybe about 25% of the area under my curve. So that means I'm considering 25% of my population. So there again, the next person that walks through the door into the room we're in, there's about a 25% probability we can infer that they're gonna weigh less than 168 pounds. Another one, let's consider 175 pounds. We're gonna shade all the area less than 175 pounds. And if we were to eyeball this, we would say we're accounting for maybe 75% of the area under the curve. So we're talking about 75% of the population. So again, chance that the next person that comes into the room weighs less than 175 pounds, we'd figure is about 75%. And this is not bad for quick and dirty analysis. However, what would we do if we wanted to get a lot more accurate? Like if we were NASA and we're launching a rocket or we're creating a building, like how would we get an exact probability? Because we'd have to do more than just eyeball the curve, right? So let's take a look at a actual question so we can piece our way through how this probability would start to come together. A little hint is it has to do with Z scores and standardization formulas. Anyway, take a minute to Pause the video if you like, read through the question. Okay, so what's the most important part about the question? Is it the average? No. Is it the standard deviation? No, it's not that, or the X value. The most important thing that we're looking for is actually something qualitative. We need to see if we're normally distributed. And in this case, we are. They're saying we're approximately normal, so now we get really excited. It means we get to sketch a curve. When we sketch the curve, we're gonna drop in 225 right at the dead center. That's our population average. And we're gonna take our 200 and we're gonna put that arbitrarily on the left side of the average. Since they're asking us about the probability a chocolate bar would have less than 200, counts, uh, 200 calories, I'm gonna shade in the direction that they're talking about, less than would be left. So I'm gonna shade all my area less than 200. And it looks like this is a very small portion of the curve that we're talking about. The exact area is 0.0062 or 0.62%. Now, how in the world did I know that? How did I know that it was exactly 0.62%? The answer to figure it out is we have to start to write down all the different numbers that we have from the question as if we were going to standardize that 200. Now, here's how we're going to do it. I'm gonna put in my 225 is my mu. My 10 is my sigma. My 200 is my x value. Now I'm gonna take all of those three things and I'm gonna make a z score out of it. So I know my z is equal to x minus mu divided by sigma. And if I fill out all my values, what I know is my z of 200 is negative two and a half. Now, this isn't a probability, obviously. What it means is my X value is exactly two and a half standard deviations below my mean. Now, what do I do with that? Well, that's actually half the key to getting our probability figured out. Now, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna bring out our Z tables. There's two of them. There's two different Z tables, and we're gonna start this by looking at the far left column of our Z table. Both of them, I have Z on the far left column. We need to go and take a look at the sign in our Z score. Our Z score had a negative sign, so we're gonna be using the negative Z chart. So let's take that one, let's bring that a little bit closer, and let's get the positive one off the page. And we're gonna write our Z score up here on the upper left side of the curve. We need that in front of us. Here's how we read the table. We're gonna to go to our Z score and we're gonna look at the first two digits. That's negative 2.5. So I'm gonna to go to my Z column, I'm gonna slide down it until I hit the value for negative two and a half. And I'm gonna underline the row because I don't wanna mess this up. So if I underline the row, that's gonna help me. Next thing I need to do is I need to look at my hundreds digit, which was a zero, and I'm gonna look at the top row of my Z chart that says 00, 01, 02, 03. 
and I'm going to circle the column that corresponds to the hundredth place value, which is going to be the zero, zero. If my z-score had been negative 2.53, I would be using the column for 0 0.03. If the z-value had been negative 2.56, I would be using the column for 0 0.06. Anyway, I've got the right column circled. I got the right row circled, uh, underlined. So the intersection of these is exactly what's going to be my probability, 0 0.0062. So the answer to my question right there again is going to be 0 0.0062 or 0.62%. And by the way, if you're somebody who really loves chocolate, this totally means that you want to buy that chocolate bar because it's basically telling us the probability 0.62, it's less than 1%. You're not going to find that chocolate bar. It's almost zero, right? So it's so rare. That means if you really love chocolate and you found a bar for less than 200 calories, you probably want to buy the whole entire case of them because it's such a rare find. Okay. Now, all set and done for this question, the most common uh, question that students have is, how in the world did the Z table work? Like, where did all these four digit numbers come from? How do we get all those probabilities figured out? The answer has to do with Z scores. It all comes back to how many standard deviations our X value is above or below the mean. Now, let's take a really simplified scenario to see a little bit further how this works. I'm gonna take a nice simple scenario, just three things on my screen. An average standard deviation and an X value. And I'm gonna write in that my data value is normally distributed, so this all still works. As soon as I see that my mu value is equal to 100, and uh, rather, sorry, as soon as I see that my data is normally distributed, I can start sketching. My center, what am I gonna put in the center of the curve? It's gonna be my 100 value. And for my 110, I'm going to put that to the right of 100. I'm going to shade in all the area that's left on 110. Now, it's going to turn out that when I run my z-score, it's going to let me know that my area is 0.8413, 84.13%. And this looks about right because it seems like we've filled up maybe around three quarters of the area of the curve. So let's go and get straight back into our z-score. That's what we need to see now. We're going to print our z-score back up, and the z-score is going to tell us we were exactly one standard deviation above the mean. Now, notice on the right side, I've got nothing. Right side of the screen is completely blank. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make up a brand new data set to put in that right side. It's going to be a different average, different standard deviation, totally different x value. But what I'm going to do special is I'm going to make sure that the new x value is exactly one standard deviation above my mean just like it is in the curve that's in front of us now. And I'm going to make a really simple average on the right side. I'm going to make it as simple as I can think of, zero. I'm going to make my standard deviation really simple. I'm just going to make it equal to a one. And my x value, I want to keep it one standard deviation above the mean, so I'm also going to make my x value just one. When I fill out my z-score, I'm going to get a one for that. Now, here's the really interesting part. I'm going to go ahead. And assuming that I'm normally distributed, I'm going to start to make a sketch. Zero is going to go right in the center of that curve because it's the average. I'm going to put one arbitrarily to the right of that zero, and I'm going to shade in all the area to the left of one. Now, this is a really important part. Notice if I compare the area, or if I compare the curve on the right to the curve on the left, they're two totally different sizes. The one on the right is so small and so tiny compared to the one on the left, isn't it? But what's critical is the area I've shaded in is exactly the same proportion in both curves, isn't it? And that's exactly why my area is identical to the area on the left. Because it doesn't matter what my x value is, what my mu or what my standard deviation is. The only thing that matters is how many standard deviations I am above or below my x value. If it helps, think of the empirical rule for a second. Empirical rule said that 68, 95, and 99% of our data would be within one, two, and three standard deviations of the mean, respectively. What's really cool about it, though, is it doesn't mention anything about averages. It doesn't mention anything about standard deviations or x values because they don't really matter. The only thing we have to know is how many standard deviations we are above and below the mean. Now, let's take a look at another example uh, graphically so we can see something really similar. 
In each of these three different curves, we're going to write in totally different averages and standard deviations. Uh, we're going to put in different x values for each curve. But if we look at how much area we've shaded in less than the x value, notice how in all three curves the proportion is exactly the same. In fact, in all three curves, what's the same? The answer is we are one standard deviation below the mean in every single curve. That's why all of them are showing exactly 15.87% area. Now, if you really kind of probe deep and you find out what's the actual calculus equation that drives the position of this whole curve, mm -hmm. this is actually what's doing it. And it's quite hard to work. It pretty much freaks us out. We're scared of this. And when statisticians invented the normal distribution curve, they kind of realized, well, you need calculus to make this work. And that's a problem because nobody knows calculus. Like your average person doesn't walk around knowing calculus, right? And they said, that's really bad because we don't want to invent this great formula that nobody knows how to use because it's not going to make us very famous. So they came up with this really great idea. They said, let's make a nice, simple, very easy to use equation instead. And that made lots of people really happy. So what they did was they rolled out the Z formula and they said, here's what we can do. We can take any normal distribution, as long as we know an average or a standard deviation, we can take an X value from that distribution and we can always calculate a Z score off of it. And there's only so many Z scores that we can have. Most commonly, the Z values are going to be in between negative three and three. And we know that from the empirical rule. Remember, the empirical rule was saying that 99% of your data is going to be within three standard deviations of the mean. And the inventors of the normal distribution knew that. So they said, all we have to do is take that big equation and we can run through the most common values of the Z distribution formula for that. And all we would have to do is take the probabilities associated with being less than the number of standard deviations in between negative three and three and put that in a Z chart. And then we'd be able to answer almost any kind of probability question with the normal distribution. So we don't need that hideous equation. We just need to know how to work the Z tables. Let's take a look at another example of how this all works. Oh, before we do, some critical things that we have to remember about the Z chart. When we're reading the Z table, whenever you look up at a Z value, whenever you look at a Z value up in the table, you're always going to get the area less than that Z value every single time. It can only give you the area less than the Z score or the Z value. So what would you do if you wanted the area to the right of the Z score? The answer is we know the area under the whole curve equals 100%. So if we subtract the area less than our Z value from 100%, by default, that would have to give us the area greater than that Z score. Now, what about if we needed in between areas for in between probabilities? What we would do is we would have, of course, two X values. We would take those two X values and we would translate them into two different Z scores. We can look up the probability of being less than each Z score. And if we subtract a smaller one from the bigger one, that will give us an in-between probability. So now that we know all this, let's start to work a few more practice examples. <coughs> so in this question here, take a minute to pause the video if you need to read through it. Okay. So what are we looking for most importantly? And the answer is, we have to know we're normally distributed or nothing is going to work. Once we're normally distributed, we're really excited. We're static, really excited. We're statisticians. We get to say, now we get to draw a curve. So we're going to go in the curve. We're going to put 22 right in the center because that's our average. We're going to go ahead and put in 19 to the left of 22 because 19 is less than 22. And we're going to shade in all the area that's less than 19. Now we need to start to think about Z scores. So I'm going to put in, I know my mu is 22. My sigma is 2.2. My X value is 19. So I'm going to take all of this and I'm going to start to make my Z score out of it. So I'm finding my Z score is negative 1.36. Now that's not my probability yet. It's not an area. Only thing it means is my Z, uh, my X value is exactly 1.36 standard deviations below the mean. 
So once I look that up in my Z chart, I'm going to find out the area is 0 0.0869 or 8.69%. So the probability of using less than 19 gallons of Gatorade is going to be 8.69%. Let's take a look at another example. Uh, take a minute to pause the video if you need, read through it. Okay, so we know we're normally distributed. That means we're going to start to do our curve sketch again. I'm going to put my average right in the middle of the curve. That's $982. And I'm interested in an X value of 1000. And here's where I have to be really careful because in the question, they're talking about more than 1000. So this time they're looking for a greater than probability. What that means is I'm interested in the area above 1000 this time. And I'm going to put this in like huge red letters that as soon as I see a greater than probability, I must do one minus the area off the chart because remember your chart is only going to give you less than probability and we're after greater than. So I'm putting this in like huge flashing lights and sirens. I have to remember to do one minus the area off the chart when I do greater than probability. So I'm going to start to prepare my Z score. I've got my mu value, my sigma, my X value coming in. And if I do my Z score, I'm going to get, 0.11 and now I'm going to go and I'm going to get to my Z charts. I'm going to put my value up there at 0.11 and I'm going to start to look up this value in my Z chart. So I'm going to look up to that 10th digit 0.1 and I'm going to identify the row I need for 0.1 in my Z chart. I'm going to underline it so I don't mess anything up and now I have to track down my hundredths digit. 100th digit is going to be a one. So that means I have to get into my column corresponding to 0 0.01 or for the 100th digit that would match my one where my second arrow was placed. That's gonna let me know the area corresponding to that Z score is 0.5438. But remember, we're not done with the question because we still have to do one minus that value. And that's gonna get us our final, final answer. 45.62% or 0.4562. Okay, let's do another example. Take a minute to pause through the video if you need. Read through the question. Okay, so what's gonna make this one a little bit more complex? And the answer is it's going to be an in-between probability. And when we have in-between probability, it means we're gonna have two X values, we'll have two Z scores, twice as much work to do. So let's start first things first. I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna make a sketch of my curve and I'm gonna put the same number right in the center that I always do, my population average. I'm gonna go ahead and put 3,000 on the left side, 4,000 on the right side, and now I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna shade the area that I'm looking to track down. I need to know that what's that area between 3,000 and 4,000. So when I do my Z scores, I'm gonna get my Z score up on the screen, even though it looks like we've got twice as much work to do because there's two Z scores, the only thing that's gonna change in your Z formula is gonna be what? What do you think it's gonna be? Now, if you guess your X value, you're exactly correct. That's gonna be the only thing that changes in your Z score. So let's work the 3000 first. I'm gonna put in on the left side, my three main components. And when I do my Z score, my Z-score is gonna come out to be negative 1.46. So what I want you to do is pause the video for just a minute, work through the Z-score on the positive side and see what you get. Okay, let's see what it turns out to be. My mu and my sigma, just like we mentioned, will be exactly the same. I just have to switch my Z-value and that should actually be 4,000, not 3,000. I'm gonna change that right now. And let's bring it back. Back, 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 here we are, X is 4,000. When we put in our Z value, we're swapping out the 3,000 with the 4,000, and now we get 1.46. Now, the biggest mistake students make right here is they try to subtract both Z scores sometimes and then look up the area for the answer that they got after subtracting the Z scores, but don't do that. That's gonna get you all messed up. We have to take each Z value and look for the area in each Z value and then we're gonna subtract a smaller area from the larger area. So this is how we're gonna do it. First, we're gonna go and we're gonna look for the 
negative 1.46 in the Z value. And I'm gonna go ahead and put all the, uh, the lines and the traceables on the screen. It's gonna tell us that the Z value negative 1.46 the less than probability matching it is going to be 0 0.0721. Now we have to track down the positive z-score, the 1.46. So on the screen, this is what we're going to end up getting, 0.9279. So to finish everything off, only thing we have to do is take both of those probabilities and subtract them from each other. And if we do that, we're going to get 0.9279 minus 0 0.07241. It's going to give us exactly 0.8558 or 85.58%. So it's letting us know the chance that your uh, average uh, credit card debt for college seniors, the probability it'll be between $3,000 and $4,000 will be approximately 86%.